Um, and thanks for your patience. Thank you very much to the organizers. It's, it's lovely to be here. It's an honor to be with all of you as well. Um, my name is Lisbeth, and um, I'm going to share with you a very short uh, presentation. And just before I begin, since we had technical problems, I'll introduce Lucas, my son, who is now three. And um, he's kind of the motivation for why I'm changing tack at this point in my career. I'm going to speak ever so briefly about 22 years developing interactive teaching and learning tools for a uh, universal design community. Um, but really, the impetus now and my big challenge we were asked to come up with two. My challenge is before he's five and goes to school we have to have invented a school system worth his time and I take on that challenge on behalf of all of your children and the next generation as well and I'll also speak about I work with a lot of communities who are dying so it's, it's a it's a fantastic privilege to follow Aaron and so many of his principles are also mine. I express them slightly differently and instead of reaching out to that massive landscape of the world. Um, sometimes what I do is work with one individual child who's dying and try to um, try to build the same kinds of principles into the learning tools that we can iterate and share with different groups. So um, I'll just say um, my official title is uh, Chair of Creative Technology Innovation, CTI. That's a field I made up. Um, I made it up when I was offered a personal chair a number of years ago, and I decided that, um, sorry, I'll just rewind this, which has decided to play itself. Um, I decided that ICT, please bear with me, um, that ICT really was a term of some previous age which sticks a big fat computer on a desk and ties people to it and makes everybody stare at a screen. And that really what we need is creative technology innovation and I'll speak about what that means and, and what I mean by ROI, which is return on investment, social return on investment, or what I call smart return on investment, would be a world where we are creating not only tools but methods and values for the next and the next next generation, um, which put empathy and creative thinking in the middle. So my argument really is that not only do we need to reinvent the whole learning structure from birth to relearning after stroke or coma and, and um, lifelong learning, it's not just the vessel that's broken, it's the content and the values upon which we sail that vessel, and I think we need to fix it all as fast as we can in what I call um, almost too late technology innovation, which is um, not just in time, it's when things are almost too late for someone who's dying or someone who needed to know something a little while earlier than they actually got the information. So very quickly, I'm not going to dwell on examples, I'm going to fast forward over examples, um, and I'm going to talk about Hippocratic education, which is another term I just made up a few months ago. Um, the Innovation Academy is one of the one of the groups between Trinity College and UCD in which we do this work. And I should say, for 22 years, um, I've been doing this work, so there are a lot of people involved. So Hippocratic innovation, first do no harm, or building of a 21st century knowledge craft. The physician's oath brings a sense of the values of honesty and integrity to the medical profession. And in the basic motto, first do no harm, articulated a set of first principles for medical intervention, the Hippocratic Oath is currently practiced sets a fine precedent for the kind of oath needed for the rest of the research and professional practice community as it reaches out to engage directly with the public. In a discussion and iteration workshop with a world-leading team in a recent ideas salon in the Silicon Valley, led by Professor Alex Jadad and his Future of Medicine project, I first gave a name to the idea of Hippocratic innovation, the method of my lifetime's work with women and children and people who are dying and universal design and technology. So now the same kinds of technology solutions are readily available for the future of medicine and the future of education, and a way of describing the, sy the synergy seemed important to find. So Hippocratic innovation is a framing mechanism to engage top researchers in technology innovation and education in a joint effort to demonstrate the principle of first do no harm to frame an explicit and fundamental set of values. We spoke about the next next for telemedicine and for technology enhanced learning. We spoke about, um, this is Steve Jobs' concept, that you, you invent not one prototype, but you need the next two sets of prototypes before the first one will work. You need to have thought that far ahead. Um, so the next next iteration um, has also been thoroughly planned. And what I mean by that, this is a, I'll tell you about these particular kids in just a moment because they're important, they're Irish Gaelic speakers. So this is the kind of longitudinal iterative design thinking that has served Apple so well over the years. And it's also, I argue, necessary in the inclusive universal co-design of all our interdisciplinary next, next generation tools. More recently, at the climate gathering out in the west of Ireland over a week ago, 
um, which is where all the politicians gathered to think about how we're going to save the earth. Um, I had the honor of sitting with some of Obama's closest advisors and with leaders from Europe and from around the world. It was an interesting gathering in a beautiful place, and we were all looking for a new narrative that might more successfully share the story of the importance of climate, of global climate change and the need to plan now to protect the generations of tomorrow. So in thinking about the next next, I ordered, offered the metaphor of home as a key concept to which everyone can relate in some way, whether because home has been lost or found, is near or far, real or imagined. Streets Called Home is one of my long-term projects for which I've interviewed hundreds of women artists around the world over 22 years, um, Tara Mooney being one here, asking them to place themselves in time, space, and technology in relation to a set of five definitions of home. The climate scientists and the environmental activists gathered on the Burren all agreed that home is also the name for our Earth. So perhaps a good narrative to share. And another good place to start looking at shared metaphors to bring communities together around a campfire of shared intense need for innovation. I also put forward the very simple evolutionary and revolutionary idea that women are perhaps most likely to lead in the next wave of Hippocratic innovation. This builds on all my early work in women's theater and performance, in that we tend to carry our concern for the next next generation in our thoughts, if not always in our genes. Essentialism aside, and with a gentle and determined belief in the power of women fueling the flames, I really want to emphasize that it's time to make these things clear. I stand by this claim, and I'm more than willing to prove its potential with all of you. In these and other high-level events and gatherings around the world, the role of women as leaders who do not, who do not demand followers is the key. And it's being articulated more and more clearly, partly in response to Hillary Clinton's powerful and persuasive notion of 21st century statecraft. The Smart Lab International faculty and research community are now addressing these issues. And we're looking to create a new form of 21st century knowledge craft, an actual ship, a vessel, a new university, and a new education system, and interactive forms of knowing and sharing knowledge in live embodied formats and online. And both of those are essential. The vessel of education is broken worldwide, and we need a radical fix, and we need it now. We need a community model that takes collaborative responsibility for the learning and safety of all our children and the next generation, too. The ship of online learning has sailed, so MOOCs and nukes are what we're thinking of as normal open online courses are all the rage now, but we have models from the past to guide us as well, starting with the Open University BBC circa 1992, and I'm just going to pause for a moment to say, from this moment on, I will, I will share only a few clips. But I, I kept them in a linear format, an old style video, because I want to fast forward. I want to give you that sense of how far we've come in 22 years, um, but also how far we have to go. And the first, the first point I wanted to make is that now that we have these tools, these MOOCs, and there's all this discussion about the economic sustainability of MOOCs and who pays for courses if millions of people take things online but don't have to pay. Recently, I was at a, a policy gathering for the future of education, and these were the issues. It was all about the economic bottom line of education. No one was speaking about values, and no one was looking even a few years ago to see what we already did. So I just want to show you a few examples from what to you will seem like ancient history. Um, when I was at the Open University BBC and we invented the first interactive media tools for sharing of, of learning in an interactive form. So we invented the first interactive CD-ROMs. Up, up till then, they'd been using audio cassettes and handouts. <laughs> and in one year, we had to invent the technology that would allow 6,000 registered students at a time and 6 million drop-in viewers on BBC Two television to all interact with their learning. Now, to me, that's a MOOC. That was 20 years ago. Six million people are engaged, and you have to think about their attention and their reason for being there. 6,000 people are paying, and you have to think about their assessment criteria, their graduation. Um, but it's not all that different. And there are lessons to carry forward as this new ship sails forward. So very quickly, and I'll just say, at the speed of light, the kids you saw in that opening sequence, they're Irish Gaelic-speaking kids, and that's one of the languages that's being lost in the world. So whenever possible, we're recording and making new animations and teaching tools for television and online broadcast with kids who speak in languages that are, are being lost unless we gather them. OK, so jumping back 20, uh, 22 years or 21 years, here we go for a few examples. You'll recognize some old hairdos here. The girl who stood in the doorway looked around. She could see nothing but the great, great prairie on every side. 
Now between our house broke the broad of the black tree that we should enter aside in all directions. The little Mars is my favorite book because it's story for children which is also readable and very interesting to adults. And because it's a tremendously visual narrative. It's a narrative that young children can read and imagine pictures, illustrations, um, images. I'll just turn down the volume. It doesn't matter what I'm saying about The Wizard of Oz, but these programs are still shown on BBC Two 22 years later. Television, interactive learning has not moved on so much, and the link to the internet has not moved on so much. But what happened in the, in the interim is that we invented tools which allowed us to think about empathy and how people learn and what they learn. So we worked then with uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company, Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, loads of famous actors you might recognize, um, and uh, Inuit people and a profoundly deaf community in, um, uh, in the north of Canada to make some interactive Shakespeare's, which looked at the interface of climate, the environment, in inward landscape, intellectual learning, and emotional empathetic learning. And again, this is 20 years ago. <laughs> I just, that's my main point, really. So I'll just play this little clip. So reframing Shakespeare in the digital age, I'll play a tiny little bit um, from this. This is how we, we broadcast to six million viewers something about Shakespeare that they might connect with personally and empathetically. Sorry. So lots of really old hairdos in here, you will see. So that was Queen Lear and a, a new performance which six million uh, students could recut to cast a woman as Lear. A new standard pedagogy, famous actors telling you how to connect to a scene from a play, etc. And again, I'm not assuming that you're interested in Shakespeare, but the way that these 20 year old learning tools work is still quite relevant. And Fiona Shaw and a, a great group of people participated here. More importantly, we got to some very interesting things like um, we were recording in an old mental hospital here in London, and then, then we were working with some uh, native peoples in Canada. And I want to play you this clip because if you really think about trying to get students to imagine their internal landscape externally, drama is a great place to do that, or at least to create the methodologies that we do, you'd use for other disciplines. So here in 24 hours, we, we reconfigured a stage in Canada. Um, again, this is now 19 years ago. Um, to, to replicate what a group of profoundly deaf actors thought that the Heath scene in King Lear would be. So if you know the play, at the moment when someone refuses to engage with someone else's political will, the whole landscape changes, a storm breaks out, people begin to die. And, it, and it's a physicalization of a storm externally from an internal. So I want to show you that because it's a, um, the idea was that the deaf actors would make this enormous noise, like the noise of the junkyard outside um, in their um, native community. So we brought in the junk from outside, inside, made it the home of this community. And then the, the deaf actor totally transforms the meaning of this play. Um, similarly, Queen Lear here, etc. So I'm going to move forward. I'm not so interested in talking about the drama, but about the interactive tools. And um, this is all based on the concept of theater games. Clive Barker, one of my mentors, here he is, the late Clive Barker, wrote the first book on theater games, which is still used in, in um, the teaching of video game um, development and design internationally. He wrote it in 1977. Um, his basic premise is very similar to what Aaron said, that we remember what has pleasure in it, that we, we build all of our interactions through life on the moments when we were pre-self-consciousness when we played on the playground and we ran and we made noise and we didn't think about who we were and how we were judged and that that's how we build the character relations which inform all our intera interactive learning. So fast forwarding through the Microsoft project um, I've been involved in where again on, on native reservations and elsewhere we've been working with these young people, seven million of them, so again 
Scalability is not new. This is now the year 2000. Bill Gates gave 100 million in hardware, software, and training funding to the Boys and Girls Clubs of America to make multilingual um, English, Spanish, and, and native language teaching tools in these club environments. And 7 million kids participated, including a lot of kids from the reservations. Um, which is the most important. And then I'm going to um, just move forward to some dance pieces. So really quickly, in about two minutes, I want to summarize another 10 years of work, which is many people's work. It's not only my own. But the idea here, again, was to physicalize. So in an entirely different community I'm speaking about now, women who have lost their legs or the ability to move their legs who want to dance again. Um, and I just want to show you a range of projects we did in this domain because they're they're about interactive learning in general. Um, so some of them are about learning to be still, and some of them are about allowing the woman in the wheelchair to choreograph a physical person who will dance for her, in my case, an animated 3D creature on the screen, um, on this robot with webcams for eyes. Three different forms of physicalization of the movement that she can't make. Um, we then, over the years, created all these other tools. View here, before there was um, iMovie and all these tools, which are common now. We just made one, um, and that's been used all around the world in teaching. Kind of interactive storyboard, um, which can also be used to help people to remember different ways that they used to move. And embodied learning for people with Alzheimer's and all kinds of other conditions is such an important tool. The tools have been around for a long time, and we need to bring them together now. Um, OK, I'm going to show you a little example from a project called Trust, building on um, Aaron's narrative. It's a story I wrote for my sister when uh, I was kind of five or six, and she was four or five. I'm legally blind as a kid I saw very little. And she was always scared of the dark and used to sleep in my bed. And I used to write stories on her back before either of us knew how to read. And it, it evolved over the years into a story called Trust, which the Carl Sagan um, Foundation and the Children's Health Fund, which is Paul Simon's charity for um, the betterment of children around the world, they funded the first iterations. And then Stephen Hawking himself funded another version. So I want to show you some examples of that, because it brings together a lot of the principles that Aaron's been talking about and that, that I'm talking about as well in a little tiny compressed movie. So this is Trust. Um, Lego Europe, I should say, also funded this project at one stage to make the avatar versions. So here I am in a very dignified um, moment in the motion capture studio in New York with Chris Bregler, also looking very dignified, hit their esteemed chair of animation. Um, we do the movements for these two creatures, which then children in hospital around the world can use so that the body capture data from me playing a character called Hope and Chris playing a character called Trust can then be mapped onto these or other avatars so that people who can't move their own bodies or who are trapped in hospital beds um, can begin to move differently. They can replace legs with wheels if, they, if they're wheelchair users. They can begin to imagine themselves differently and take that inward landscape and project it outward. And this was all part of a, another large project um, called HOPE, Hospital-Based Online Persistent Pediatric Environments, where with Harvard and Johns Hopkins um, medical doctors, we also looked at what are the impacts of the fact that in children's hospitals and in children's schools in hospitals, um, kids are now given games, video games, and um, competitive interactive tools rather than books. How does that raise their, um, uh, their uh, um, attention levels instead of giving them a sort of sense of calmness. So I could show you many more examples from this kind of work, but I think you get the idea. The core of it all is this, that Audrey here in this instance, the person with the disability is always the one who can release the biggest impact. So it's only Audrey in this particular game performance who can release the 3D butterflies that fly out into the audience. It's all about creating a bigger impact and empathy. Um, for those who are limited. We then did the same project in Singapore, and this is only a few seconds long, so I'll show you, in the KK Children's Hospital for Children in Singapore with the BBC. Um, and the idea here was that kids who, who had severe asthma and other conditions, so whose bodies could primarily move, but who couldn't get outside and engage with their own environment, could create their own personalized learning tools. Um, First in 2D, they would draw their pictures. Then the animation artists would draw them in 3D. Then we'd make these robotic chairs and act interactive interfaces that would physically move the children in relation to their screen. And finally, they'd move through their own personalized le learning environment with a physical kinesthetic connection to a story they had made. Um, 
it's now only six years later than this or 10 years later than this. It's now possible to do much more sophisticated things, but it's the basic idea. Movement and an embodied connection to your own story transforms your learning experience and connects it to those of others. Um, and then um, we did the same project uh, with Stephen Hawking's help in, in the Stephen Hawking School in East London where the children have very severe multiple disabilities um, and we just reconfigured the story so that it wouldn't trigger um, epilepsy for anyone. And in all of these projects, we're dealing with the same kind of universal design principle. It's not that my team, Smart Lab, quote, only creates tools for people with disabilities or um, people in domestic violence shelters or any of those extreme communities we work with. It's that in making tools for all those extreme communities, we learn the basic human lessons that we need to involve um, in bringing the value systems into all of our online learning so that the MOOCs will have that value system embedded. Um, so very quickly I'll move forward, but I'll just say this little boy here, no one thought, no one thought he could respond to any learning environment and he responded amazingly. I'm gonna move forward over some of our first um, uh, biofeedback sensor games and locative games and all this, um, our first efforts to allow um, teens to make their own biosensors. All of this work I'm assuming is perhaps familiar to you now, but I'm fast forwarding on purpose because it's only a few years ago and it already looks ancient. Um, and I then wanna show just one more, one more example. A lot of our work at the moment is focused on eye control, and if you don't know the technology, I'll, I'll play a very small clip, but for, um, for anyone who can't move their body, so if they have cerebral palsy, um, motor neuron, um, any of those conditions, cystic fibrosis, and or if, if anyone has had a stroke or been in a coma and is arising out in what would be called locked-in syndrome, often it's the eyes, which are either the most enduring um, or most longitudinally effective interface. So if all you can do is move your eyes, you need a technology which will track your eyes. It's a very simple idea. Um, like a lot of technologies, the one that we use had been around for a long, long time. Companies have used it forever to sell products. So for instance, if you're driving down a highway and you're looking at a billboard and you're not looking at, for instance, the Coke logo, Coke is tracking where you're looking and they will move the logo to where the most eye traffic is. So that's the technology. We didn't invent it. We just hacked it and retrofitted it so that it would be an interface for someone who can only move their eyes instead of a tool to sell products. And that would be typical of our work. But I just want to show you a brief example. Um, I'm nearly done now. Just to give you an example of how these tools can be transformative if, if we build them into other systems. This is Katie Gilligan, a young lady I, I dance with um, since the Special Olympics. James Brosnan here, who I'm writing a book with for MIT about technology and education. He can only use this muscle in his neck um, and his eyes um, to interface. I'm going to talk over my colleague Mick here just for a moment. I'm nearly done. But I just want to describe to you the moments when somebody's parent or someone's wife or someone's child, when they haven't been able to communicate for some time, for whatever reason, suddenly does. On Christmas Day, when James played music for the first time using his eyes, he was 33 years old. But it was as if he were three for his mom. She heard it while she was making us dinner. It changes people's lives. And these technologies exist, and they are free. We need to integrate them into these other tools we're making. That's really my argument. So we do these performances involving Katie and many others. Um, and I want to play a tiny clip here for a reason which will become clear, and then it's my last example. So while Mick shows you, in the interest of time, I'll just describe. So you're in the hospital room now of a lad called Daniel O'Hare. Daniel uh, lives in, lived in Dublin. He, um, when he was 16, on his first day coming home from school, um, a bunch of thugs stabbed him. 
and uh, he died and was brought back to life, but he then had no movement from the neck down. And he was then in this hospital for five years, looking at a wall, not even looking at a window, not even looking at a television, looking at a wall, until my colleague Mick here, through a series of circumstances I don't have time to explain, but called synchronicity, we met Daniel's stepdad um, uh, with another group of wheelchair users we were working with, he invited us into the hospital. Mick came, set up the system. So this is the very first day that Daniel was able to communicate after those five years. And you'll meet his mom and dad very briefly. That's his folks. He then went on to play music with his, his um, favorite bands. Um, I'm going to fast forward over our more sophisticated technology tools. Um, and I want to end with Daniel again. I could tell you about these other projects and all the PhD students and all that. But I really want to end with Daniel because it sums up my main point. So if you'll bear with me, I'm nearly there and then I'll finish. So my question is, what tools can we co-create to enable us all to speak, write, sing, dance, play, and learn equally across language and cultural boundaries? Um, Daniel wanted more than anything, and so many of the people we work with are like this. He wanted to go to a football game, and he knew that he might die if he did so, but it mattered to him enough that he was willing to take that chance, and the tool enabled him to say so, um, and to say he was willing to take that chance. And he also wanted to play music with a band called Kila, who we work with very closely, and he did that as well, and performed live on stage. Um, then, sadly, he died, and I, I just want to... Um, play a little bit more and summarize why I think not only Daniel, but all the Daniels of the world matter. Because there's so much locked in knowledge within these people who have a lot of time, um, a lot of time to think about what we all need to know and just need the tool to help us hear it. So I dedicate this to Daniel and his mom and dad there. Um, and the first time he was able to control his own world again after, after that brutal stabbing. Um, he passed away, it was only in November of this past year very suddenly, um, for reasons no one could have predicted. But his mom, Liz there, says that um, he lived again before he died because of these tools. So we carry on this work in his honor, and we're now funding PhD scholars to invent similar tools. Um, so in assuming the, the basic first principle of first do no harm, we seek to invent the next generation and the next next for a more inclusive society in all languages and cultures and for all people. In the words of Martin Curley from Intel, if you want people to stop going from A to B, you need to create the possibility of C. So all aboard, Port C is our next destination. Um, for 22 years, I've called it Smart Lab. Some of you will have called it other things. What it's called in the future doesn't really matter, but it matters that we build it together. And that we keep it safe for all of our children's children and well beyond. That's what I would call 21st century knowledge craft. And thank you for your kind attention.